It's been a little while since I've given a full rack tour top to bottom, and I figured with the start of 2024, there's no time like the present to see what changes I've made over the last year and what lies ahead for the future of my home lab. Let's dive in. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and this is my home lab. This is the server rack that I keep out here in my garage. And you've all seen it in various iterations since I started the channel all the way back in 2017. But what changes has it gone through to get to this point? And what are my plans for it in the very near future? That's what we're gonna talk about today. One thing I think I need to clarify just a little bit is what is a home lab and how do I use mine? For me, there's really two definitions of home labs or two main use cases for home labs. One is running production servers to make your life easier with services you want at home. And that's pretty much where I fall into my use case. This server rack is where I run my business. It's what stores my video files and current projects, important documents. It makes sure that I have things backed up to the cloud and it makes my life easier by running services like Plex and Pi-hole and VPNs and all that kind of thing. That's what runs in my rack and allows me to do my day-to-day -day tasks. There's another classification of Home Lab, and that's really where I started my journey with Home Lab, and that is building a server or set of servers that you can use for professional development. That is learning on hardware and tinkering with things and giving yourself an environment that you can tinker with and break and fix and learn from. While mine still does serve both those purposes, its primary function is to basically host my business and all of my operations. And so that's where my primary focus of this server rack has always been. One question I get all the time about my home server rack is how much does it actually cost to run this thing, specifically around electricity costs? Because power is not cheap for most of the world. In my particular situation, power is incredibly affordable. I am very benefited to live in an area where power is about 7.4 cents per kilowatt hour and 98% renewable. That's not something a lot of people can say. One of the focuses this last year was to actually bring my power consumption way down. My server rack at one point early this year was idling at about 900 watts. That's 900 watts of power not doing anything, just powering the servers on and running its basic services. As of right now, the entire server rack top to bottom idles at about 350 watts, which is absolutely insane. And it's why I can actually stand next to it and have a conversation now. It's not incredibly loud and it doesn't require nearly as many fans or nearly as much airflow to keep 350 watts of power cooled. Right now at 350 watts at 7.4 cents per kilowatt hour, my rack runs about $225 to keep powered on 24 seven, 365. So $225 for the entire year. Again, it's incredibly affordable and I'm very blessed and benefited to have such affordable power here. But speaking of keeping the server rack cool, there's one thing that I haven't mentioned that I also run inside this rack during the summer months, and that is my air conditioner. And I think that's where we'll start this rack tour at. Down here at the bottom is my Triplite 7KRM. It is a 7,000 BTU air conditioner designed specifically for rack mount installations. I did a full video on the install of this as well as its efficiency a couple of years ago, and I will have links to everything in this rack down in the video description if you're interested in learning a little bit more. In short, this is a rack mount air conditioner, again, 7,000 BTUs of heat displacement, which is good for about 1,000 watts of heat generated by the server. So even when I was generating 900 watts of heat inside the server rack, this was able to keep it cool during those summer months. Now again, I only operate this when the temperature outside gets above about 85 degrees Fahrenheit or roughly 30 degrees Celsius. And I have environmental monitors to tell me when those temperatures start exceeding those limits. This, when it's running at its peak efficiency, can actually create about a 17 degree Fahrenheit delta or about nine and a half degrees Celsius between the ambient air in my garage and the air inside of the server rack. To keep all that cold air inside of the server rack, there's actually a vinyl sheet very similar to what your grandma would put over the carpet in her house back in the 80s. Uh, that keeps all of that cold air right in front of the servers, creating essentially a plenum space here in the front of the rack. 
Now, because this is essentially a heat exchanger that's built into my rack, I've got to do something with all the hot air that it's taking out of the environment. So I actually have this plumbed and directing all the hot air directly out of the back of the garage. It doesn't recirculate within the environment. That would be kind of pointless. And uh, it actually does a phenomenal job. I've been running this about two, at least the last two summers, and it has done fantastically well in that time. But because it's a heat exchanger, it itself does get quite warm. So I've got a 2U spacer in here before any of my other equipment starts. This in total takes up, what is this, 8 rack U? So 10 rack U of space just for my air conditioner. Ugh. Up next, you might notice a hole in one of my components here, and that is the battery out of my UPS unit. Uh, this is an APC... Uh, smart 1500 VA 2U Rackmat APS and is a smart UPS unit with actual network connection and environmental monitoring. So not only does this provide ancillary or backup power for my server rack to keep everything on when there's a power outage, it also uh, is able to report all of the environmental data from around my garage and inside my server rack, both internal and external temperatures. It's a fairly old unit and still uses lead acid batteries, uh, but replacing the batteries is still much more cost effective than buying a brand new unit with lithium ion chemistry in it. It's not quite as efficient, the servers don't run as long, but at 330 watts, I can actually run my servers for upwards of two hours on this battery backup unit. So not terrible at all, and it still totally fulfills all the needs that I have for it. So why are the batteries outside of my UPS right now? Well, the most recent power outage that I had, uh, I think did them in finally. Uh, these batteries have been in my rack for, gosh, five years now. Uh, I replaced the batteries when I first built my server rack all the way back in my last house. I think that was in 2018 is how long this has been in service. So going on six years now, it was definitely time to replace them. Now, a new battery unit like this uh, was about $240. So again, very cost effective to keep this one going rather than switching to new chemistry, which would only give me more runtime, which is something I really don't need here. Moving up the chain, we come to the first server in the rack, and this one is truly what I use for my home lab. Uh, this is a server that I can tinker with, make, break, destroy, and uh, basically do it over again and keep on going. This was my cloud gaming server, and it will be again, but with some very significant upgrades. Stay tuned to the channel so you don't miss that. A quick rundown of the internals that are in here right now. This is running an Epic Roam 7742 64-core CPU with 256 gigabytes of DDR4 registered ECC memory running at 3200 MTS. We've also got a Dark Power Pro from Be Quiet 1200 watt power supply. I've had a number of different video cards in this server for doing virtualized gaming or cloud gaming as I like to call it. I've had anything from three 1070 Ti's to three Titan XP's all the way up to a pair of RTX A5000's. Now I didn't quite get to publish that video, I was waiting for some other things to work themselves out. I'm hoping to actually swap the A5000's back into here and do that video before I go and upgrade all the components to we'll just say the next generation of cloud gaming. The next time you see this server, it will probably have those A5000s into it, and then we're gonna replace every last thing inside. Next up is a pair of servers that I built earlier this year, and they might be a little controversial with some people, but these two servers are what allowed me to get that power draw in my server rack down to a somewhat acceptable level. Each of these servers is rocking an Eerying Tiger Lake 11th Gen motherboard with a 45 watt Intel i9-11900H engineering sample mobile CPU. What that essentially means is each server has an 8 core 16 thread chip with 64 gigabytes of DDR4 running at a TDP of just 45 watts. There are two schools of thoughts when it comes to virtualization. One is get as many cores and threads as you possibly can and build yourself something like an Ivy Bridge with 16 cores and 32 threads and even double that up to 64 cores and 32 threads per board. Uh, or you get yourself much faster single threaded chips that can do twice the number of instructions per clock as the older counterparts. And that's what I went with here. While these may only have 8 cores and 16 threads, they are literally 2 to 1 per core performance of an Ivy Bridge CPU. 
Each of these servers also has a pair of silicon power A60 one terabyte NVMe drives in a ZFS mirror for redundancy on the system, booting the OS, as well as storing all of the VM hard drives. I do have a couple of NVIDIA cards in these as well. The bottom one has a Tesla P4, while the upper one has a Tesla T4, although I've never really done any configuration with them. I was planning on doing some virtualized gaming so my daughters would have some systems to be able to play Minecraft with, but we ended up not needing those as we have a couple of gaming desktops in the living room now. We may end up still enabling those cards for full virtualized gaming in the future, but there just hasn't been the need to set it up at this point. I also went ahead and added some SSD cages to each of these and fully loaded them out from the SSD server that I took apart earlier this year as well. So each server also has four 1.92 terabyte Patriot SSDs installed in there. Again, I was planning on building these out into either a fully or highly available set of SSD storage, but I opted for some NVMe storage in my NAS, which we'll get to momentarily. Overall, these have been fantastic for home server use. Again, only 45 watt TDP on the CPUs themselves. You can tune them up to 60 or even 65 watts if you want, if you want a little bit extra performance out of them. But the systems as a whole draw less than 100 watts from the wall at full tilt. That is absolutely insane considering how many VMs you can actually load up on these systems. And we're almost back to a comfortable height, so you'll excuse me if my head is out of frame for this shot, but the next item in my server rack is my KVM console, or essentially what is a keyboard, trackpad, and monitor that only takes up a single U inside my server rack. While I don't need this all the time, it is fantastic to have bare metal access to all of the servers in my rack at a moment's notice. Not all of my servers run IPMI, and so sometimes you just need a physical keyboard, mouse, and monitor attached to a system. And this allows me to do that. Unfortunately, the actual display driver for this LCD doesn't like to always negotiate the resolutions properly. And so sometimes I end up with some garbled displays, uh, offset images, so you can see right here that my console is actually shifted all the way to the right by a fair margin. And in fact, it's probably cut off on the other side as well. While it does work, I'm not thrilled with this as a unit, and I will probably end up trying to source a newer one, maybe even with a 1080p display sometime in the near future. But overall, I do like the form factor. It folds up nice and small and slides into a 1U rack space. Now, one thing that might be a little bit difficult to see is this guy right here. This is actually a temperature and humidity gauge that I added into a blank panel so I can check uh, system specs at a glance without having to dial into my UPS unit to get environmental data. Right now we are rocking at 56 degrees Fahrenheit and 62% humidity. Again, it is winter time here in Oregon. All right, and now I can finally stand up fully and talk you through the rest of this. Up next is my NAS. This is the Craftinator, uh, very generously provided by 45 drives for my home server rack. And again, this is essentially what operates my business. This is where all of my video storage goes. This is where all of my current projects, all of my important documents that I need to keep records of goes. This is the primary server inside my server rack. Now those who watch the channel know it's been through a couple iterations already and a couple of those aren't even on camera. Uh, I famously put one terabyte of memory into my Craftinator a couple of months after I got it. However, that system has been swapped out and it is currently running an AMD Naples platform with a 7601 32 core CPU and a Supermicro H11 SSL motherboard. A very common combo that is actually very readily available on eBay right now for somewhere around $300 to $400 if you find the right seller. As far as drives go, this thing is fully kitted out. I have seven Seagate Exos 18 terabyte enterprise drives, as well as eight HGST HE8 helium filled enterprise disks in the front of this for a total of 15. On an add-in card, I also have four Western Digital SN770 two terabyte Gen 4x4 NVMe drives, and that is where all of my current projects go. So I have incredibly fast network access to some high-speed storage on this NAS device. I've also added in a 100 gig network port, which we'll get to again momentarily. Now, all three of those disk sets are running in a RAID Z2 for a two disk parity. And for those playing the home game, that gives my Seagate Exos drives about an 85 terabyte capacity after RAID uh, configuration, my eight terabyte HGST drives about 42 terabytes of space, 
and my SSDs have about five and a quarter terabytes of space. So plenty of usable space. And in fact, each of those pools is sitting right around 50% utilization, which is exactly where I like to see them. As far as what operating system I'm running, I have gone through a couple iterations over the last year, but I think I finally settled on running TrueNAS Scale on bare metal. This is only running as a NAS. It's not running any other virtualization systems. It's not running any applications like Plex or MB or VPN. All it's doing is hosting my files. And what better to do that than a NAS that runs on bare metal? Up next is the newest member on the block, and that is the HL15, again from 45 Drives. This is their first crack at a home lab server, and I'm actually hoping this will fulfill that purpose in my server rack, giving me a true playground to play with, whether it comes to virtualization or uh, file servers, and give me an environment that I can tinker with and demonstrate different use cases to you at home. Because the majority of my server rack has gone towards production or business use or required services, I don't really have any systems that I can tinker with right now, and I'm hoping this one will fit that bill. Now, it did come preloaded with a Supermicro X11 motherboard and a Xeon 3204 6-core CPU. Now, that's going to be just fine for a lot of file server uses. In fact, later this week, you'll see a use case in which I deployed one of these to another YouTuber. Again, make sure you're subscribed. You're not going to want to miss that collaboration. But I want a system that I can tinker with, that I can run 30 different virtual machines on, or I can play with different file system arrangements or high availability or something like that. That's going to be what this server does inside my server rack moving forward. Next up, let's get into networking. And it's really funny looking at the progression of my home network because what is my edge switch right now started as my core switch. And every switch has gone kind of through that same iteration through the years. This right here is the Mikrotik CRS 32824P. It is a 24 port gigabit PoE plus switch with four 10 gigabit SFP plus ports on board. You can see I only have around eight of the gigabit ports plugged in right now, as well as the 10 gig port right here for uplink to the rest of my network. While it's not being fully utilized at this moment, it is still a crucial component as it is the only power over ethernet that I have in my server rack. That allows me to run my access points, a couple of security cameras that I've got around the house, as well as a couple of IPMI devices down here in my server rack. Right above that is a 24 port patch panel, keeping everything nice and clean and uniform inside the rack, at least when it comes to my RJ45 connections. Over on this side, I do have some LC fiber pass through ports, which unfortunately you do have to get essentially one meter cables at their shortest, so it leaves some of this stuff hanging out and about. But overall, it still keeps everything much cleaner than it would be if I was just routing those cables through, uh, you know, a 1U grommet or something. I wish it was a little bit cleaner than it is, but overall, it's hard to get better than this. Now, I mentioned my KVM console down lower in the rack, but that was only partially true. The keyboard, monitor, and mouse only do display and connectivity. They actually don't handle the KVM switching. And that's why I have this unit right here. This is an eight port VGA and USB KVM, and it has essentially a pigtail that jets off to every server in the rack, allowing the keyboard, video, and mouse to pass through to that console. Next up, we get to the switch that was my core switch last time I did a server rack walkthrough. However, now it is serving more as a top of rack switch with only, gosh, am I down to two 10 gig ports in my server rack? I think I am. This is the Mikrotik CRS 317-16S Plus, and it is a 16-port 10 gigabit switch. As you can see, while it does have a couple of cables still plugged in here, only two of those are active, so it is essentially acting as a pass-through switch between my 100 gig network and my 1 gig network. That's its only purpose right now because I've eliminated most of the 10 gig network out of my rack entirely. Those two Erying virtualization boxes, those are still running on one gig network because not a lot of services that I have that are just serving applications need more than one gigabit connectivity. My Plex server certainly doesn't need 10 gig. My Pi hole certainly doesn't need 10 gig. Why go through the trouble of wiring up 10 gig if you're not going to use it? Overall, this is a fantastic switch in the CRS317, even though it's barely being utilized right now. At one point, I did have 10 of the 10 gig ports filled inside this switch, and it really did run dynamite for the two or three years that I ran it like that. 
it probably will be doing a little bit more here in the near future as I roll out a couple new servers for the 2024 year. But right now, yeah, essentially it's working as a media converter. <laughs> and now we come to the switch that answers the question, why is my 10 gig switch being underutilized? And that is the CRS 504 4XQIN, again from Mikrotik. This switch I reviewed uh, earlier this year sometime. This is a four port QSFP28 switch. That is four 100 gig ports inside this tiny little 1U switch. And finally, we come to the most recent switch in my server rack and what is now serving as my core switch, and it is the Mikrotik CRS 504 4XQIN. It is a four port QSFP28. That is four 100 gig ports in this tiny little 1U switch. At one point, I did have two of my servers with full 100 gig links. I've actually decommissioned my 2U uh, DL80 Gen 8 HP server. It's no longer serving a purpose, and so uh, port 2 is just kind of sitting here idle. However, the Craftinator NAS is still running at 100 gig links. Port 3 is running single mode fiber all the way back to my office to another CRS504 switch, which has full 100 gig to both of my desktop PCs which means either of my PCs has full 100 gig access to the Craftinator NAS. So, was it worth setting that network up? I can fully say after more than six months of testing, no. Uh, running 100 gig in my network is completely stupid. I don't recommend doing it. At most right now, no matter what setup you have in a server rack, no matter what desktops you're running, 25 gig is probably the theoretical limit of file transfers as long as you're running Windows, SMB, or a standard consumer file share. Even with a ZFS array with four Gen 4 NVMe drives inside Craftinator and 100 gig direct point-to-point -point connections to both of my desktops, the most I've been able to get out of a SMB file share is about a 20, sometimes trending 25 gigabit connection. And that's under ideal circumstances. While the network may have the bandwidth to carry pretty much any amount of traffic that I want to sling between those two devices, the problem is I'm starting to run into physical limitations of the media that I'm writing or reading from. That is, if I'm copying from an SD card or a SATA SSD, which runs on my Ninja Atmos here and records all of my videos, I've still only got 550 megabytes per second of read speed out of that that's not gonna translate into two gigabytes per second to be able to feed into my server. As far as reading data back off of the server, even though I've got four Gen 4 NVMEs in here, I'm still running into limitations of SMB as a file service share itself. It seems to be limited, again, to between that 20 and 25 gigabit per second, at least as far as single thread operations when it comes to current generation CPUs. So, 100 gig, it's cool to talk about it. I love that I have it. I love that I actually got it to work within my environment. The problem is it's completely pointless, even with the high-end hardware that I'm throwing at this with a number of Gen 4 NVMEs and a 13900K or a 5950X on the other end of things. It just doesn't translate into real world performance storage gains. And finally, we come to the last couple of items in my server rack and they really haven't changed from the last time we went through this tour. My firewall is still a Unify UDM Pro running stock firmware and basically only being used as a router and a controller for the other Unify devices that I have in my network. I have three access points that I run here in my house. Uh, it runs perfectly fine with gigabit connectivity to my WAN. I have two ISPs here at my house. One of them is Comcast. I get a one gig by 35. <laughs> Uh, WAN connection as my primary network, and then I also have a Starlink connection serving as a backup, as well as an internet connection that I can take when I'm off camping, and I can still do live shows and edit videos and that kind of thing remotely, utilizing that when I'm on the road. At this point, if you have terrestrial internet that is wired, Comcast, Cox, Fios, whatever, I would definitely recommend that over a Starlink connection, as Starlink has fuzzed out on me a couple of times. However, I've also had Comcast fuzz out on me and having Starlink as a backup connection has been a fantastic little benefit of living where I do.
If Starlink is your only other high-speed option besides HughesNet or getting something that's maybe a 5G connection, Starlink is probably the best option that you have. And I'd fully support it if you need it in your environment. In fact, I know of a couple of people who have deployed those to remote work sites so they can have high-speed internet when they're up in the mountains. I've taken mine and done a couple of different live streams uh, off my Starlink dish as well, and it has worked fantastically well for that purpose. Last but not least, I did rack mount my cable modem a couple years ago. It is an RS Surfboard SB8200. It technically will run beyond gigabit speeds, but Comcast won't give me beyond gigabit speeds. It technically will do uploads of up to 400 megabit. But again, I'm stuck at 35. And finally, if you are a member of my Patreon on the premium services, you saw a video in which I built this. This is just a 2U blank plate that I thought I'd have a little bit of fun with my laser engravers. And it says, home lab, sweet home lab. If you're interested in buying something like this, I might consider putting these on the store. So let me know if this is something you'd be willing to pay for. Uh, I've been toying with different things that I can add to craftcomputing.store to kind of spice things up, particularly for home lab use case or maybe like boutique system builds. Uh, let me know if you'd like some vanity rack plates. Might be something that I can carry here in the very near future. And that's going to do it for my rack tour here at the beginning of 2024. It's literally New Year's Day that I'm filming this on. Let me know if you found this at all interesting, and let me know if you guys have any ideas for things that you'd like to see done with my rack in the new year. I'm always looking for new ideas and content that I can bring to you. As always, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on the social medias at Craft Computing. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, again, visit craftcomputing.store for my latest in pint glasses, uh, drinking accessories, coasters, and in fact, I'm going to add some coffee tumblers here probably within the next week. So make sure you check back often for new merchandise. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Mm. You didn't think I'd make it through the video without opening a beer, did you? Uh, this is a beer that I reviewed on the channel before. This is from Breakside Brewing. It is the Rainbows and Unicorns uh, Tropical Summery Goodness. You're in for a magical ride. It's just a very simple IPA. I love the can art on this can. Uh, it's just fantastic. I, I love the, the Rainbow Unicorn. Um, just a good, simple, drinkable IPA. It's like five and a half, six percent. Very bright without getting overly citrusy. There's a reason domestic beers are popular, and that's because ice cooled, out of the fridge, out of the chiller, uh, they're very refreshing. They're very palate cleansing. This has a lot of that going on without getting into like the IPA bro kind of flavors. It's bright, it's refreshing, it's a fantastic summertime beer. But even here on January 1st, I find it quite good. <sighs> Cheers, everyone. Around the house, as well as a couple of IPMI devices down here in my server rack. Ow. That hurt. I just hit my arm on the latch for the server rack. I don't know if you know, those are made out of solid steel. Ow. Oh, there's already a knot forming in it. Oh, that's going to hurt.